We're live. Hello. Thank you for joining our Google Hangout today. We're here today to celebrate food as a means to understanding the world and all that's in it. Without realizing it, we use geographic reasoning to make decisions about food all the time. Where to go for dinner, how to get there, what kind of food to buy, and whether or not we want to change that decision based on its potential social or environmental impacts. We're joined today by food professionals from around the country to discuss why food matters as they share their personal food stories and perspectives. We'll also chat about ways to incorporate food into classrooms across various subjects like math, history, social studies, and of course, geography, using the upcoming American Thanksgiving holiday as an example. At any point during our conversation, you can ask questions of any of our participants in two different ways. The first is by posting questions to the event page below the screen you see, and the second is through the Q&A feature. Please join me in welcoming our speakers today. We're joined by Courtney Ahern, who currently serves as president of Slow Food Chicago, the nation's third largest chapter of the global slow food network that promotes good, clean, fair food for everyone. She has experience working across the food chain on domestic and international agricultural issues at the Greater Chicago Food Depository, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, Chicago Ideas Week, and the Food Tank, the Food Think Tank. Courtney's also worked on a small family farm in upstate New York and has learned the proper technique for catching red ants in northeastern Thailand. Elin Maliska is the program coordinator for the Test Kitchen in the National Geographic's new museum exhibit, Food, Our Global Kitchen. She was a math teacher in Chicago Public Schools before switching over to the world of museum education and is coming to us live from the Test Kitchen in the new exhibit. Chef Matt Crutter is the executive chef for Sodexo at National Geographic. Our food program at National Geographic is called Local Artisan. This means that Chef Matt not only designs tasty treats for the staff of Nat Geo to enjoy, but more importantly, he makes decisions on a daily basis about sustainability, where our food comes from, food waste management, and economics. We're also lucky today to be joined by Pam Carrigal wells the executive producer of Eat, the story of food, a new special coming to us from National Geographic Channel this weekend. As many of you know, this week is our Geography Awareness Week, a week whose goal it is is to show people the ways in which they rely on geography in their everyday lives, to inspire more people to think geographically, and to improve geographic education in our schools. This year's Geography Awareness Week is near and dear to our stomachs as we're focusing on food. National Geographic Society at large is examining the future of food all year long as a special initiative, and the National Geographic Channel, as part of this, will be premiering a new mini-series called Eat the Story of Food this Friday night. Food is such an interesting topic to work with our students because it's tangible and we interact with it almost daily. It's also a wonderful storytelling device. So we're going to start our conversation with Pam. Pam. What is it about food that makes it such an important and useful way to tell stories? Well, you, as you sort of hinted when you first started to talk, Sam, uh, it's, it's just so relevant to all our lives. Um, and it's really something that, that is so ubiquitous, we almost take it for granted. It's like, okay, we're going to make a TV show about air, when they said we're going to make a TV show about food. Um, so at first we thought, wow, that's such a big topic. How are we going to figure out how to make this informative, thought-provoking, and also fun to watch? And I think what became very clear to us as filmmakers was that food really is at the core of the human experience from the beginning of time, even our ancient ancestors, and we're able to use it as a tool to learn about anthropology, um, biology, evolution. Uh, we're able to use it American history, world history, um, language, culture. And so we really found that there was no shortage using food as sort of the core of the discussion to learn about us and our world. And our theme to the show is quite simple. 
something we've all said a million times. We are what we eat. <laughs> what we added to that was, we are what we eat, and eating has made us who we are. And so we sort of stick to that theme through the six hours of the show. So what are some specific examples of that biology and history content that we can look forward to that educators might be able to pull into their classrooms? Well, I think that just about every episode has really wide-ranging disciplines represented in unique ways. So the kids are, kids or students are learning about um, stories that seem like they're stories that they've heard before, but in this show they're learning about them again. For example, 1492 Christopher Columbus. We're able to tell that story from the perspective of a spice called pepper. And pepper, as one of our historians said, it was worth its weight in gold. You could pay your rent in peppercorns. If you were a serf, you could buy your freedom in peppercorns. Basically, as she says, you are able, if you're finding black pepper, you're set up for life. So that was really a motivating factor um, for Christopher Columbus uh, in his travels. And when he found the chili pepper, all he knew was it was really spicy and really hot, and that's why he called it pepper, even though it really isn't related to the black pepper that um, our historian was talking about earlier in the segment. So it's interesting to see some of the surprising twists and turns we're able to take with what you might think of as classic history and turn it on its head. Um, but in that same episode, we talk about the biology of flavor and, and how we used to think that we had you know, a certain number of, of, of taste uh, receptors in our, in our mouths. So we had no idea that taste was also, um, you know, influenced by smell and by many other aspects. And so we have biologists and we have food specialists who teach us about that. So in the same 10 minutes of the episode, we go from biology to uh, world history and then we might go to a more pop culture history story. So there's, even in those stories, um, there are incredibly insightful tidbits to be learned. Yeah. I love that cracking open history that students already think they know and examining it in a new way. I know when I was watching the show, I was really surprised that Pepper was such a driving force for exploration, and it was a story that I had never heard before. Um, and I we, tell, we tell other interesting um, historical anecdotes, like the role that oysters in our seafood episode plays in the founding of New York City. And, you know, we again, we've heard other uh, anecdotal history stories about the founding of New York and what was behind that. But the oyster story isn't as well known. And, you know, this... It was covered in oysters, absolutely covered in oysters. But then we also take oysters through their evolution to our lives today, and including some of the modern oyster dishes like Oysters Rockefeller. Everyone thinks that dish was designed where the Rockefellers came from, New York State, but actually it was in New Orleans at a famous restaurant called Antoine's where they actually created that famous dish called Oysters Rockefeller. Huh. It's an interesting mix of pop culture and what you would consider a history that you learn in a textbook, um, which I think is actually a really great segue into sort of some of the work that Courtney does, um, because Courtney does a lot of work with slow food and food heritage and all the ties that bind us to food. So Courtney, I know you've interacted with food on a lot of different levels. Can you share some of those sort of hidden stories that you found that Pam was talking about? Sure, yeah. Um, well, I'm so excited to be here. Any chance I get to talk about food um, is is my favorite kind of conversation. Um, and I think that's really kind of what Pam was talking about and what I found to be true, too, is that everybody has stories about food, whether they're personal or your family or these um, more historical stories that are tied to, you know, our country, our geography. And I think um, that's kind of what I've found along my food journey too. You know, when I, I've always loved food and 
I grew up being an avid eater. It was sort of the joke in my family, but I never thought about it as something that was more than just personal. Um, you know, we cooked in my home when I was a kid. My mom would give us one teaspoon and one like quarter cup and have us bake, and that was a project. And now looking back, knowing everything I know, that was an incredible lesson in math, but she made it come alive through food. Um, and so I'd always had this love and appreciation for it, but I, I didn't know um, that it was something I could pursue as a career or something to study. And so it really wasn't until I got to college and had the chance to study abroad, which sort of ties in this, this geography component too, um, where I studied in Thailand and I stayed on a, a small family farm. And like a lot of these stories go, I got really sick. Um, and long story short, I you know had to, to go to the hospital and I spent a couple days not eating. And I didn't speak very much Thai at all. And so I was um, staying with this host family and we, we were really trying to communicate about how I was feeling and how I was doing. Um, not speaking the same language. And finally, um, maybe the third morning, um, my host mom asked me, you know, are you hungry? And I said, yeah, I, I think I am. I think I'm hungry. And she got so excited that she ran outside and uh, killed a chicken for me <laughs> immediately and fried the chicken and cooked it for me. And to this day, it's the, the best thing that I've ever eaten. Um, I think, one, because it was so fresh and delicious and organic and it came... Um, you know, from, from right outside, but also because it was this moment where you realize that food is a language in itself and that it was how we were able to communicate with each other and share, um, you know, her relief that I was feeling better and my excitement and gratitude to her for taking care of me. And it was this really um, special moment to me where food kind of came alive as more than just this personal pleasure. Um, and really a way to kind of look at the world. And I think that that is how I have framed the, the rest of my career and my experiences. And like Pam was saying, you know, food, I think, will always be interesting and dynamic because, you know, whether you're interested in hunger or the environment or biology or religion or um, ethics and law increasingly with GMOs, you know, it it's really is this incredible lens to look at the rest of the world, but that we also all have this um, deeply personal attachment to as well. That story about killing a chicken is so <laughs> interesting because, one, we all laugh, but that's what's so weird about that is that's where every chicken comes from. Right. And there's this sort of dissonance between us understanding what we eat and, and sort of the source of that. And a lot of times kids don't actually know what vegetables even look like before they're cut up. Can you talk a little bit to that and how we can sort of, you know, without going around killing every chicken we see, express where kids can, uh, like, understand where their food comes from? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think um, that's where you see a, a, a huge movement right now for school gardens and nutrition education and ways to kind of make food come alive for kids um, so that I think once you see what you're eating and you see where it comes from, you're going to you're gonna want to eat it more, you're going to like it more, you're going to feel that connection because you saw where it grew or you met the farmer who grew it. Um, and that's something that Slow Food works, at, works on a lot too. You know, we're working with um, Chicago Public Schools here. Um, we have a fantastic um, team of wellness uh, educators at CPS who are working to bring nutrition education and school gardens into schools. and. Um, they bring in a lot of partner organizations like Slow Food to kind of um, bring in some of those elements that Pam was talking about. So Slow Food, um, our mission is to promote food that is good, clean, and fair. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of terms that fly around out there with organic and natural. And um, the reason I'm sort of attracted to Slow Food is because I can really identify with good, clean, and fair. Those make sense to me as concepts. So. Um, good for the earth, good for the people who grow it, grown in a way that is clean, um, fair to the people who grow it. And I think we can take some of those concepts and kind of bring them into the classroom and, and bring them alive. Um, and there are, there are some really cool initiatives. Um, one is called the Arc of Taste. And it's my, my favorite thing that Slow Food does because it's actually an international catalog of endangered species of food. Um, and this is where you get a lot of these incredible stories. And I think it's a great tool to um, teach kids not only, you know, this is where your food was grown, but here's the story behind it. So 
here's how this seed came um, from Poland and an immigrant put the seed in his pocket to save it from his hometown and he ended up moving to Wisconsin and he only planted these peppers in this one community in Wisconsin and now they're being grown all over the Midwest and um, you know or we, we have a garden here in Chicago on the west side and most of what we grow are African heritage um, crops and so we can talk about you know these plants and seeds coming over this ties back into sort of the um, colonization theme of you know how do you look at migration of people through the lens of food and seeds and how did something come from Africa through the south up north on the Mississippi to the great through the great migration and end up in Chicago and you know why are we eating these things here today so I think you know it's partially getting kids into a garden seeing how things are grown but then also finding ways to tell these stories that make food seem not like oh I have to eat my five vegetables today but like I get to eat this carrot that like went on this boat and came over here and um, so I think there are some really cool ways that you can kind of make it come alive absolutely and I think that's a theme that I'm starting to notice is how do we make food come alive for kids in a way that makes learning other things really interesting. Yeah. And Chef Matt, you actually have an amazing story about how food came alive for you from a sustainability perspective. And I think the important lesson here is that, you know, whether you're a college student abroad and food comes alive for you then or when you're fully working, it can come alive for you. So would you share that with us? Yeah, I'll be happy to. Um, you know, here at National Geographic, we have a culinary program called Local Artisan, and we take a great deal of care in selecting our food and also looking at all of the other parts of the process there. Um, I didn't start off as a chef who knew about all of these different aspects. I was mostly interested in cooking. That interest came from coming up in a, growing up in a family of great lady cooks and men who tended family gardens. So I always appreciated nature and the bounty that it provides us, but I have a moment in my career that was the, you know, my moment of great awareness and that really solidified my commitment to supporting the environment and helping to preserve the, the bounty that it um, supplies us. <clears throat> um, I was working in Las Vegas uh, at the time. Uh, this is a, you know, a very famous place of celebration and um, I don't know about other families, but we have the Thanksgiving celebration coming. And one of our family traditions was always a plate of shrimp to begin the meal. In Las Vegas, people famously eat a lot of shrimp. And here I was working in Las Vegas, and I was preparing shrimp every single day. And I'm going to stand up here and give you guys an idea. This box... here represents a sink full of thawed shrimp. This is about how many shrimp we use every single day. That's a now, lot. <laughs> I was one chef in one very small hotel in a city of very large hotels. And I started to imagine in my mind that the hotel next to me was 10 times the size of my hotel. That's 10 times as much shrimp as that every single day. And that city has 20 hotels that size and many smaller hotels as well. And I literally began to lose my physical balance thinking about the enormity of this volume of shrimp. Las Vegas alone, and then Los Angeles and San Francisco, Tokyo, Chicago, New York, all around the globe, people consuming shrimp every day. What an incredible test to our environment this is. So that was really my moment where I had that global awareness that I said, boy, this is incredible, and you know, I'm playing a very small role but I need to do it right so that we can continue to enjoy these things and that these things don't damage the environment for future uh, generations and, and for ourselves. So I did a little bit more research to help 
uh, you know, the kids understand and use a little bit of, uh, you know, the modern day research tool, tool Google, <laughs> and a little bit of math. Um, some of it, you know, a little loose, so we're going to, you know, this is fun math here. <laughs> and I found out that, you know, estimates today are that Las Vegas goes through 60,000 pounds of shrimp in a day. Oh. Nationally, the U.S. consumes about 630,000 tons of shrimp in a year. As we all know, our bodies, and the same goes for shrimp, are almost entirely made of water. So if that equates to 158 million gallons of water rep that can be represented by all of these shrimp we consume annually in this country. So I imagine most of the kids are going to be familiar with this image. And so we're that looking is, at an image of the reflecting pool in Washington, D.C. That's right. Viewing down towards the, uh, the Washington Monument there. So here is a map of the National Mall, and you can see the reflecting pool highlighted right here. If you wanted to fill that reflecting pool with all of the shrimp that's consumed in this country in one year, by the way, that pool is as deep as this box is high, so we're talking above your knee, full of shrimp, you would need 24 pools the size of the reflecting pool to contain all of those shrimp consumed in the U.S. in one year and wade through them above, and they'd be above your knee. So <laughs> what I'll finish with is for the students to think about not only that volume of shrimp, but 90% of all shrimp consumed in the U.S is farm raised in Asia. That farm raising shrimp so, uh, you know, pushes natural habitats aside and it involves a tremendous consumption of electricity, fresh water, and gasoline to deliver those shrimp to your grocery stores and to our restaurants so that they can be there every day for us to enjoy. Absolutely, there's certainly a lot of ma both math and geographical and environmental sort of considerations and variables in that equation. And so thanks for sharing that example. I think that's really powerful stuff. Um, another example that I want to get to today during our Hangout is to go to our test kitchen with Ellen in the National Geographic Museum. We are located in Washington, D.C., so we are a little bit biased to D.C. geography. But Elin, <laughs> uh, Elin was a, actually a math teacher in Chicago Public Schools for a long time before we stole her away to the museum. Um, and so she has some brand new activities that she wants to share with us that she has written with, uh, in preparation for the Thanksgiving holiday. So take it away, Elin. Thanks, Sam. So I'm coming live to you guys in the test kitchen right now. The test kitchen is open every day that the museum is open. So it's every day except for Christmas. Um, and it's a halfway through the exhibit, so you're pretty hungry by the time you get to the test kitchen. And what would an exhibit about food be without a chance to experience food? Um, so I've developed all the educational programming that we do here in the test kitchen. Um, and I really, my goal is to use food as an entry point, to use it to facilitate a conversation about what do we eat, why do we eat it, what are your traditions, how, how has food impacted your life? So to echo what was said earlier, from the day we were born, we breathe, we sleep, and we eat. So this is something that really unifies everyone, and everyone has something to say about food. Um, so one of the lessons that we're doing right now, um, tying into historical context, is talking about the first Thanksgiving in comparison with your Thanksgiving in 2014. So giving students a menu of what would have been served at the first Thanksgiving. So this is things like venison, waterfowl, fowl, um, plums, cornmeal. Um, students look at this list and then they go, but where's the turkey? Where's the pumpkin pie? Where's the cranberry sauce? Like, where is all this good stuff that my grandma makes for me? 
uh, they didn't have that as a first Thanksgiving. And so using that, comparing what we eat now versus what we eat at the first Thanksgiving, to think about what are the cultural influences and the historical influences that have changed what we're eating and why we're eating it. So they didn't have cranberry sauce at the first Thanksgiving because pilgrims ate all the sugar that they brought over with them. So they were out of luck. Um, and same thing goes with pumpkins. Pumpkins and sweet potatoes were not, and potatoes, I'm sorry, were not introduced into the area yet at that time. So they weren't available. Um, I like to think about it kind of as the, uh, the pilgrims were the first people to pioneer the eating local campaign. Uh, they had to totally readjust what they were eating to be eating seasonal food and local food. They had to totally think about, um, you know, they didn't have all the food that they were used to. You know, um, back home, so they had to re reevaluate what they were working with um, and eat things that were local and sustainable and seasonal to them. And so, so this activity so, is as simple as this activity is as simple as having students write down menus, right? And so just right. having them use that like pen to paper Common Core writing skill. Yeah, so it's great also with Common Core compare contrast skills. Um, so what, when we're in the test kitchen, we have, you know, one is this is the first Thanksgiving menu, and then give folks an opportunity to write their menu and compare and contrast and see what is the difference there, what's missing, and then use that to talk about why. Great. And But you have other activities that you've done with students in the past that don't pertain to Thanksgiving. Is that right? Yes, I do. And so I'm a little biased because I was a math teacher, um, and you'll be amazed at how well your students um, can understand different math concepts when you use food to tie it in. So uh, we were doing fractions, and we were talking about um, adding and subtracting fractions. And I said, okay, you've got uh, two-thirds, and you're subtracting one-third. How much do you have left? That's very abstract for students. So saying, you know, here's your pizza. This is how many, how many slices of pizza you have. Your brother eats one slice of your pizza, that's one third of it, how much do you have left? Um, students being able to see this visually really, really helps them to think about um, what this means, what does a fraction mean, what does it look like, and tie it into their everyday life and think about um, how this is a real math concept that's actually very, very important. Um, another idea. Um, and something I used to do with my students was to have them plan a meal. So you can make this as multi-step as you want. Um, this is really great for Common Core problem solving um, and multi-step problem solving. So I brought in my grocery store flyer today. So this is something you would give to your students and say, okay, you're planning a meal for 10 people. What are you going, and you have this much money. What are you going to serve? What, do you, what can you afford to buy with this much money in order to feed this many people? And you know, don't just buy 10 frozen pizzas because they're on sale and that's easier, but thinking about, um, you can add in that nutritional component as well, adding in uh, the FDA's um, food pyramid and the government food pyramid and making sure that it, it aligns with that as well. Um, talking about price and talking about um, percentages if something's on sale, how much are you going to save? Um, there's a lot of other math and other um, multidisciplinary routes that you can take in with just this one lesson. Yeah, it's, it's sneaky math. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so, it is sneaky math a little. And we've talked about a lot of different ways to sneak in sort of learning principles under the guise of food today. But what I wonder yeah. is, do any of our participants have questions for each other now that you've gotten to hear each other's spiels? Does anyone have a burning question for one of our other panelists? I have a question for uh, Chef Matt. Please. Um, Chef, can we talk about Meatless Mondays? Well, absolutely, Pam. We participate in Meatless Mondays here. Now, we don't uh, exclude the use of meat on Mondays because we have many people that we serve in our cafe um, and some are not willing to uh, try you know new you know adventures in cuisine uh, but we do have many participants and we even offer a five percent discount on Mondays for those that are willing to uh, take the leap. It's appreciated by the vegetarians and vegans and it encourages a few others to uh, give it a try as well. And 
going meatless one day a week can significantly reduce your environmental impacts. Um, Courtney, are there other, or anyone else, are there any other simple changes that people can make at home to automatically start thinking a little bit more geographically about their food and their connections to the global community? Yeah, so we've talked a little bit about um, all these terms and uh, local is a big one that you'll hear and I think it's kind of a hot button term. There's there's lots of different definitions. You know, does it mean buying something from the farmers market? Does it mean that it comes from your state? Does it mean that it comes from within 150 miles? Or um, I think there's lots of definitions but for me what I like to think about it as is just knowing somebody who grew or made the thing that I was going to eat. Um, and so something that we encourage people to do with slow food is, you know, just take baby steps and do the best you can with what you have. So just try to live um, a little bit slower in your everyday life. And I think that's a really empowering thing. I think food can be um, increasingly overwhelming the more choices we have and um, you know, the more all these labels get introduced and I think the more you can just kind of break it down and think about it as like, you know, what can I eat that my grandmother would have eaten or what can I buy that is the most, the least processed or um, that gets as close to the source as I can. So whether that is at a farmer's market, great, or if it's just buying from the produce aisles, that's great too. Um, but I think, um, you know, the more we can think about food as this really empowering thing, um, we all have the opportunity to make choices every day to just work towards a better food system. And I think that's what I love so much about Chef Matt's story is he was, you know, he was in a position, he saw a problem, and he found a solution. And maybe we can't all change the way a whole cafeteria is sourcing our food, but we can all change the way that we're eating at home. Or we can ask our mom to buy something different. Or, um, you know, the more teachers I talk to who teach about food in the classroom tell me that kids go home and ask their parents to buy a vegetable that they've never bought before at the grocery store. And I think it's all those little changes where we get to vote with our fork every day and make choices about um, how we want to see the food system change that to me is really exciting and empowering instead of feeling like I'm just one person, everything's so messed up, what am I going to do? Um, so I think things like that, eating at home, eating with your family, um, eating fresh, fresh things, eating things where you know the person who grew them, because um, I think that's another element we haven't touched on a whole lot today is like the labor that goes along with food, um, and I think that could be a whole a whole nother lesson plan if we wanted to go down that path too. Sure. Well, there certainly are hidden costs of food, which I think is definitely what we've sort of hinted at, as you said, with our ties to geographic and larger communities and larger processes and systems. And so, a quick plug for our education website. So. Well, if, for those of you that haven't been, National Geographic provides free resources to educators from our website, natgeoed.org. And we have a really great interactive available at natgeoed.org slash food that hits exactly at what Courtney is talking about. It's all about the hidden cost of things, be it food, be it clothing in your closet. And it's all about how do you calculate that global footprint that you don't even recognize that you have. Um, so uh, a fun question. We've been talking a lot about decision making today and I wonder for everyone today what was the best and or worst food decision you've ever made? <laughs> Elin, do you want to kick us off? I'll put you um, on the <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think the best food decision I ever made um, when I was studying abroad in Greece um, down, so you know when your parents say you have to walk uphill both ways to get to school? My house is at the top of the hill, so I did have, to, and it was like in between two hills, so I did have to walk uphill both ways to get to my favorite bakery. <laughs> so, um, there was a bakery at the bottom of one of the hills, um, and they didn't speak a lick of English, um, and it was really good for my Greek at the time, um, but they just used to serve giant trays of baklava and homemade sandwiches. Uh, so I used to go down there and get lunch almost every day. Um, I would kill for some of that baklava now. Um, but it was definitely worth the trek. And nice to know that this is a small restaurant, a small bakery. It was all family run and owned. Um, and really knowing where my food came from. You know, you could see them cooking it in the back. So definitely the best food decision I've ever made. 
What about you, Pam? Do you have a food decision you want to share with us? Well, I sort of feel like it, it was a food decision made by someone else for me. Um, I had worked on a series that National Geographic did for quite a few years called Taboo. And we did an episode on food. And um, I did a story in that episode that featured a company in California that made lollipops with insects. Now, what's interesting today is that many people who focus on sustainability are looking at um, ways of incorporating insects into our diets. Um, and I completely understand the reasoning behind that, but personally, I did struggle with it just a tad when they asked me to go onto a I guess it was like a TV talk show in New York to promote the season of Taboo. And then they told me I had to eat ants Ew. on camera. Um, yeah. And I'm a little bit of a fussy eater already. So I felt I had to do it to be a good sport and to promote our fantastic uh, cultural anthropology series at you know its first season. And so I ate the... I ate the ants, and I didn't enjoy it, but, but on the sustainability side, I do understand why there's a lot of smart people uh, saying that we do need to look at insects as an incredibly smart source of protein, and I'm sure Courtney could tell us uh, more about that. I'm not sure if she's ever eaten bugs. We'll have to ask her. I have. I've eaten so many bugs. Um, <laughs> This is one of my favorite topics to talk about with friends, and I think that there's like cricket flour now that you can buy and make cookies with, and uh, yeah, I, I wasn't going to go the insect route, but I think we're going there, so I'll tell my insect story. Um, when, I, when I lived in Thailand, I lived in um, kind of the jungle, and tree ants, red tree ants, were a huge um, food source for the the village that I was living in and um, it was the women's job to get up really early in the morning and go out into um, the forest and look for nests. They would be really high up in the trees and they made these incredible um, poles that were probably like eight, ten feet long with a basket on the end. And so what you would do is you would spot the, the nest and you would kind of shimmy your pole up there and like cradle the, the nest and get it down and they would make red ant soup uh, which not only had the ants but it also had the larva in it and the ants were still alive so when you ate it you could actually feel <laughs> it on your throat. Uh, it I'm was, sure it was very nutritious. It was, yeah. I'm sure incredibly high in, high in protein. Um, I'm not going to say it's the best food decision I've ever made, but it was certainly one of the most interesting and memorable, and I think it's one of those experiences that makes you keep in mind that, you know, there is no single diet, there is no um, single way of hunting food or cooking food, and it's so easy to say, like, oh, that's weird, or, um, you know, I can't believe you eat this thing or this thing, and I think it's, it's a good reminder um, that food is different all over the world and that we all, you know, have these these stories to tell. But yeah, the the live crawling was not my favorite. I much preferred the the dead chicken, I think, of these, <laughs> these two stories I've told. And Chef Matt, have you ever eaten bugs? <laughs> yeah, we've all eaten bugs whether you know it or not. <laughs> um it's not been a, a habit of mine. Um, I am aware of some of the emerging products, the cricket flower that was mentioned. Uh, you know, I think that there's uh, some wonderful ways to get protein uh, through uh, a proper vegetarian diet if you choose, and um, you know maybe the the bugs can you know benefit from the same uh, animal friendly uh, <laughs> approach that we like to take through uh, vegetarianism. <laughs> well, I hope that I will see a bug product in the National Geographic cafeteria very soon so that I can try that. I'll make it just for you. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that. So I want to say a huge thank you to all our participants today. 
Um, we're just about out of time, but I do want to give everyone the chance to share one last closing thought with our viewers. So I'm going to start with you, Elin. Do you have one last final sign-off to say? Yeah, just a quick story. So um, I think the important thing about food is giving people the opportunity to try it. So in the test kitchen a couple weeks ago, we were sampling a kale salad. And a mother brought her child in, and the kid wanted to try some. And she gave it to him, and the kid ate probably about three or four plates of kale salad. The mother said, I never in a million years would have fed my kid kale because I didn't think he would have liked it. Um, and so it's just, I think, all about um, offering those opportunities to people and have, helping them to make the connections in their daily life. Excellent. Pam, last words? Well, of course, I'm going to have to tell everybody that we're just hoping they're going to not only tune in to eat the story of food on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights this week, but when they do, I, I'm hoping that they all feel that they look at the food on their plate in a completely new way after watching the program. I know that from working on it for the last year and a half, I certainly do. So. That's what I'm hoping for. So start looking at your food a little bit differently. Yes. Matt, your sign off? I really hope people can take the adventure, learn to cook. Don't be afraid of it. You know, start simple. Start with fresh and natural ingredients. You're going to love the product that you make yourself so much that you're going to start to do it more and more. Excellent. And Court? What is yeah. your takeaway for our viewers today? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I think food can seem like this really sort of complex thing. And I think the more you delve in the policy and, you know, there's so much happening with food. But I think the takeaway for me always is that, um, well, it, it's so basic and it's um, such a privilege and it's so precious. Um, and it should be about pleasure and joy. And I think the more that we can focus on those things and incorporate um, the joy of food into all these other things in the classroom and our daily lives, um, the more that we will appreciate it as, as this incredible resource. To turn the joy of food into the joy of learning. There we go. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you all so much for spending some time with us today. Your thoughts and philosophies are invaluable, and it's great to bring you all together. Um, I want to remind everyone to celebrate Geography Awareness Week through the lens of food simply by doing what Pam mentioned. Look at your dinner, your lunch, your afternoon snack just a little bit differently today. Um, you know, if you want to celebrate it in a different way, try some of Elin's activities at home with your students, for yourself, uh, with your own children. Uh, you can find more free food educational resources at natgeoed.org including clips from Eat the Story of Food. Uh, we actually have the pepper clip that Pam mentioned at the beginning of the Hangout available for you guys. That will be up there next week. Um, if you want to see the full program, tune in to Eat the Story of Food for the three-night event starting this Friday. And Saturday and Sunday continue at 9 p.m. on the National Geographic Channel. And if you're in the D.C. area, be sure to come and pay us a visit, both at the Nat Geo Cafeteria with Chef Matt and if in our food, our global kitchen exhibit, you can try some of that kale that Elin mentioned. So thanks everyone so much. Uh, take care and we'll see you next time. <laughs>